As Copa America and the Euros heat up, we're taking a look at the soccer world with U.S. star Tobin Heath. Plus, J.J. Redick and Carlos Alcaraz got head-turning new deals, and Stephen A. Smith wants one, too. It's Friday, June 21st. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. Many believe that Carlos Alcaraz will be the next big thing in tennis, and that list now includes Nike. The swoosh signed the 21-year-old three-time Grand Slam winner to a 10-year deal for a reported $15 to $20 million annually. Alcaraz will also get his own logo, something Nike has only done previously in tennis for Roger Federer and Rafa Nadal. The Olympics on the horizon, athletes are competing to qualify for the U.S. national teams. The U.S. swimming trials at Lucas Oil Stadium drew 22,209 fans, which is now the world record for a swimming event. The gymnastics and track and field trials made news for a different reason. The track and field trials, which go on through the end of this month, carry a top prize of $11,000. For gymnastics, the top finisher earns $0. Stephen A. Smith wants to be ESPN's highest paid employee, an honor currently held by Troy Aikman, who makes $18 million per year. In his latest tuned in column, my colleague Mike McCarthy reports that Smith is looking for $20 million a year. He could be incorporated into the network's NFL coverage, and if he doesn't get what he wants, he could take his podcast and YouTube show and production company and strike out on his own. The guess here is that Stephen A. and ESPN get a deal done. And the Los Angeles Lakers have hired J.J. Redick to be their new head coach with a four-year deal believed to be worth around $32 million. Selecting someone who has never coached before for a high-profile hire is notable enough, but this one has the added wrinkle that Redick co-hosts a podcast with LeBron James. Last year, LeBron said that Anthony Davis is now the face of the Lakers. However, the Lakers just hired his friend and are the favorites to draft his son, so this is still LeBron's team that is assuming LeBron doesn't exercise his opt-out clause following the NBA draft. Up next, Tobin Heath has been a central figure in the rise of women's soccer in the U.S. Now she has one foot solidly in the world of media and commerce. We spoke about the state of global soccer, the rise of the NWSL, and how she wants the sport to grow. That conversation is coming up next. Very excited to be joined now by Tobin Heath, soccer player, co-host of the Recap Show, co-founder and co-CEO of Re-Inc., and also I hear a diehard Arsenal fan. Welcome, Tobin. Thank you. Happy to be here. Great to have you on. So let's start with the recap show. You you co-host with Kristen Press, now back for a third season. What's the show about and how has it evolved over time? Yeah, um, originally it started as our version of kind of a talk sports show. Um, we launched last summer uh, during the World Cup, so obviously there was a lot for us to talk about. Uh, it was the first time for, for both Kristen and myself not playing in a World Cup for over a decade. Um, so we had a lot of institutional knowledge and I think authenticity and trust on on that uh, sporting event. Um, but I think what we realized was there was kind of like this massive gap missing in, in women's sports media, which is actually just like our culture. And we were like, well, we've always kind of opted into like this sports culture that kind of existed before us, which is is cool. You know, most of us learn sports, you know, through you know, men, watching men play or, you know, male coaches or men's players that we looked up to in the game. But now there's a whole generation of women's professional athletes. And I think with that has come like a level of sports culture that has yet to be unearthed. I mean, like in terms of media, we had kind of witnessed it and been a part of it for so long, but we hadn't really seen like the media actually show and embrace kind of the fullness of what our culture was. So so we had kind of coined it gal culture and it was inspired by the badassery of the U.S. women's national team. Um, and it's kind of this unapologetic, unfiltered version of, of women's sports. Um, and we kind of brought that with our like, you know, knowledge and understanding of our sport, um, which I don't think there's many people that know more about uh, kind of the ins and outs of a World Cup um, than Chris and myself. And, and we hit it off and, you know, we had insane guests just from like the constellation of people around us. Um, But I think it was more so the conversations that really resonated with even more than just like the general sports fan. Yeah, no, that's an interesting point that, I mean, you know, obviously as women's sports grow, women's sports media is growing along with it, but uh, yeah, like, is there like an equivalent to say, you know, Stephen A. Smith, uh, you know, Skip Bayless, like those, those sorts of like, talky figures that you know have this unfiltered you know style to them Uh, obviously they're they're filtering on some level but um (laughs) maybe not very well (laughs) yeah right it's 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 an interestingly selective filter um 
but yeah, I'm wondering um, what you think about like um, as that grows in in women's sports, as you know, you and others fill that gap. Do you have any thoughts on how it's going to feel different from sort of the male version of the same thing? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think there's a massive difference. I think for a long time, like kind of women's sports has kind of diminished like what has make, made them unique in the sports category. And I think there's a lot of reasons for it. I think there's was kind of like this archaic sports house that like women's sports didn't really fit into, just kind of got raked into, right? And I think there's this new sports house that's being built that like looks and feels more like what women's sports is. And the types of like conversations in gal culture is like what we call like living at the intersection of sports progress and equity. And that's because kind of the dialogue and the lifestyle that goes with women's sports is you've always been fighting for change. Like you've always had to fight to get the next thing. So there's just like this inherent level of progress that's built into women's sports that like it would be a shame not to talk about it because it's such a big part of our sports culture. So we really lean into that aspect. Like we really lean into the progress and the equity that comes with women's sports. And we actually believe that it makes the door so much like bigger for, you know, folks to actually come into this new sports house. Um, I don't believe women's sports like is just about women. Like I actually think women's sports is the future of sports. I believe it's progressive. I believe it's inclusive. I believe that it's like completely abundant. So I think that's like what's really unique. And, And what we found is kind of by making that door bigger, it's kind of brought in people that have kind of felt othered by sports, like that it wasn't for them um, and has really kind of like removed this barrier um, in terms of like, we welcome people that maybe are like, I'm not super sporty. It's like, oh, well, do you like, you know, like fashion? Are you like into like understanding more about women's health? Like, are you into like queer culture? Like all of these buckets that are like really important to what women's sports is. We're like, that's the type of like culture we're leaning into. Yeah, it's super interesting. And to what degree does that make its way into the locker room? I mean, once you're there, is it just about we're trying to win a game? Or or is that all those cultural forces? Can you feel that even at the level of, you know, how you interact with your teammates? Oh, yeah. I mean, like, just like a simple, like, I mean, I don't know any like men's locker room. And maybe this is the future of men's sports where like, you have like, you know, somebody in there with like a child, like it's their, their kid before a match or like somebody breastfeeding before a game, you know, like that's like a huge difference. Um, but like our culture and our, our locker room is very, very different. I mean, I, I can't actually like, obviously I've only seen what men's locker rooms are based on, you know, the countless amount of kind of men's sports films and documentaries and all these things. So I can kind of envision what a men's locker room is. Like I haven't spent much time in a men's locker room, but I can only assume through all of kind of the media that shows a certain lifestyle around it. But I can say based on that and based on my understanding and experience in in women's locker rooms is it's so distinctly different. I mean, you can't even imagine the different types of conversations that are being had. Like the sports are the sports. Like There's really not much to it, but it's the culture that's more unique. I mean, ultimately, at the end of the day, like you put on a jersey, you go out on the field, the same rules apply, you know, but it's the culture and the culture really dictates then the lifestyle around the sport. Yeah. I mean, the... The breastfeeding example is notable. I mean, I just think I just about wanted how, like, to like create a very, yeah, very visceral like right. I mean, a baseball player has a kid, like a you know, a male baseball player, and they miss like two games. And then it's <laughs> yeah. like, all right, we're back. <laughs> like, um uh and uh yeah, and obviously it's not the same on on the women's end. Let's bring in uh Re Inc., your your company. Um you co founded with with other uh US women's national team stars. Um how, is that kind of, I mean, I know the podcast has kind of worked into this is all kind of one umbrella, but uh, what else does Reink incorporate? Yeah, we are an ecosystem. It's it's actually kind of fun because like we've been around for a while. Um, I, I laugh and joke because I remember when we were first like kind of pitching, you know, the idea of a, a company and at the time, like, you know, for like women's athletes, starting a company was an act of kind of re- revolution in itself. Um, and I laugh because we, you know, typical like pitch decks and those, those sorts of things, you know, there's this slide that is just like traditional, like why now, like women's sports, why now? 
And it was like a nauseating slide for us because it was like this idea, like you had to kind of explain women's sports, you know? And, and I laugh because now, you know, four or five years later, it's like the quickest slide you go through is the why now slide on women's sports, you know? And it just shows how much progress has been made in, you know, four to five years. And, and I kind of laugh about it because it's like, like everybody's amped on women's sports right now. Right. And, and it's great. And it really has been a groundswell of like so many folks that have invested, you know, their careers, but also like their time and energy into it um, and have believed in it. But it's, it's funny to me because it's like this idea when, when I hear people excited about it as if it's something new um, and it certainly isn't. Um, but I will be the first one to kind of praise the incredible momentum around it. Um, but yeah, our company was started actually in commerce. We started with a single t-shirt. Um, and then we started our subscription platform, which is a platform that represents over 60 countries. Um, we call them our reimaginers. Um, it's a global community of folks that care about the sports and the change making. Um, and they, honestly, we created this platform because they just asked for it. Um, for folks that have been a part of, you know, women's sports, you know how fragmented the community is. And they were like, just, you know, build us a place that we can come together around the things that we care about, the sports and, and the change making. And we we're like, okay. And it's honestly the the goal to our business is is our community. Um, there's incredible things happening in it that just, you know, blow blow our minds. And then Obviously, our, our latest endeavor was the creation of Remedia, which um, for us was the thing, like we've always had a flywheel business between commerce, community, and, and content. And for us, the media division is what has really like started our flywheel up in a big, big way because we were really looking for top of funnel, like bringing the biggest amount of audience. And what we found is there wasn't just a need for this type of like, type of media, but there was a huge want for it. Um, and, and that's what we've really leaned into in terms of, you know, growing our business um, is kind of increasing that top of funnel audience um, and bringing them into being like hardcore reimaginers. Yeah. And, you know, you keep saying women's sports, plural, and to, to what degree, I mean, how quickly does it become like one community of, you know, soccer, basketball, softball, you know, the PWHL is, is up and running now. Um, does it feel like it's, it's all one thing once you kind of, you know, take one step out of your, your, your immediate community? Yeah. Yes. And no. So within our community, like, I think a great example is like, we have these series called watch, watch with, and, um, essentially our, our community gets together and they create watch parties around all different sports. And, you know, our community started in global football, just by the nature of the founders, but within these watch with, we've seen watch with in Mount, downhill mountain biking, you know, obviously the PWHL, like we had a massive, as soon as that league was announced, we had massive amounts of watch wisps for, for those events. Um, and also like a lot of learning around new sports um, and obviously the WNBA and, and soccer globally. So I'd say like with women's sports is like kind of this more collective feeling around the sports, but I will say like some frustration that I have is this idea that women's sports kind of gets clumped into a bucket because people like think it's small, like where they'll be like, I was in, you know, a uh, pitch with, with um, uh, a media executive and he was saying like what their priorities were. And it was like, you know, we have golf, we have the NFL, and then we have, you know, women's sports as if like, that was a singular sport and right, yeah. that kind of rubbed me the wrong way because, you know, we're trying to get to like this, this big scale of what women's sports is. And as long as there's folks in the room that are trying to categorize women's sports as this one thing, um, I think that's keeping it small. Um, and I believe that like there are big enough communities for, for all different sports and, and each one of them is important. And, and I talk about the, the Caitlin Clark um, effect and, people were like, oh my gosh, women's sports is having a moment. And I, and I was like, we need to be like really clear about this. Um, yes, there's this idea, like, yes, there are women playing sports, but really like women's college basketball had a moment, you know, and now we're seeing like spillover, like that now we can say, and the WNBA is now having a moment, but like, let's be specific here in what we're talking about, like what it is, because I think people are, 
then thinking like that, you know, college to professional, then it kind of like blurs the line of like, what is this thing that we're talking about? But we need more specificity, I think, in, in women's sports when we talk about it, because then we're talking about scale. Yeah. Yeah. And on those lines, um, the NWSL like is, is one of the first leagues entities mentioned on that of that trend. Uh, they're starting a new media rights deal, bringing in $60 million per season. How do you think the league has handled its growth so far? Yeah, I mean, like being a part of the league uh, for a long since its inception, um, it's growing pains, right? Like it's still early days. I think, you know, you're always kind of giving so something and taking something with these deals and they never feel quite right because they're not there yet. I think we're traditional media and like media rights in general, I think folks need to understand that media rights really dictate revenue for these leagues, like entirely. And when we talk about traditional media, we're talking about a media landscape that is dominated by men's sports, where like actually the top, you know, five men's sports are clawing for like the biggest media deals. Like those sports are clawing for them. There's not much room. And I think like where traditional media has kind of failed uh, women's sports, I feel like new media and new um, emerging media platforms and social media has really leaned in, right? Because it's like an opt-in type of of uh, sports is women's sports. Like men's sports, you don't have to opt in. It's everywhere, right? Like even if you don't want it, it's there. But like women's sports, you really have to have a muscle for it. You have to opt into it. You have to pay more for it. Like the NWSL is such a great example because we're in this place where like, yes, big deal. Like we got a lot more money, but we're fragmented. We have it on four different locations. And, and sometimes even in those locations, it's distributed in different locations. Um, and it's still a real growing pain for us um, that we haven't gotten um, into a place that I would say is like where women's sports lives in the subconscious. Um, and, and those are going to be like growing pains um, and, but yeah, look, lots to celebrate in progress. Uh, I think I'll always be the person that that wants more. Um, <laughs> and uh, I think that really suited me well in my, my career. But I think the same is true in business. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a really at an interesting moment where, um, yeah, the, the deals are getting much bigger. Pay can start to increase. Um, but you, it's so easy to see the gap, too, of like, we could really use use more money for the players, you know, use better training facilities, um, more teams, more roster spots. Um, like it, it, you, you can see the growth so clearly and you can also see, you know, how far you have to go so clearly. Yeah. And so, um, and I think the leagues want to be on the cautious side of, you know, let's not get so big so fast. And then all of a sudden we can't pay our bills. Um, yeah, definitely. I think there's a level of like that. Um, there's the reality of the marketplace. Um, and, and I love that you never want to get out over your skis. Um, but there is a level of like investment. And I think that we've just started to get serious about the level of investment that's required for women's professional sports. And I think for most of my professional career, there was just honestly, it was lesser expertise in business. Um, shallower pockets and more um, more geared towards, you know, because women's sports, it's the right thing to do. Um, and that made women's sports suffer greatly. I don't think like kind of running a sports team is like this new business idea. I just think that we haven't had the like level of expertise required to be taken seriously or the level of, of dollars. Mm, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, Copa America is starting. We have the Club World Cup in the U.S. next year. The World Cup in 26. Looks like the Women's World Cup likely coming here in 2031. Uh, what would you like to see come out of all this activity and global attention on the U.S. around soccer? Uh, I'm so stoked. I mean, right now we have Euros and Copa. I'm excited to watch Argentina play Canada um, tonight. That's going to be certainly interesting. Uh, but there's this like massive amount of energy coming towards the U.S. when we're talking about um, global football. And I think it's a great time for our country to really absorb it. Um, look, we're, we're a great sporting country, but we're not like a footballing country. Um, but I think it's a, a real opportunity to change like generationally the way that in particular men's sports is here in our country. 
Um, I think about what the 99 World Cup did um, for me as a kid, you know, being in the stands and, you know, my generation that then w went on to win 2015 and 2019, I think every single uh, woman in that locker room had a story from the 99 World Cup. And I can imagine, well, hopefully if our, our men's team, you know, does well, which hopefully they will, um, could really inspire um, a whole generation in the way that they view football in our country, which I think could really like shake us up a little bit um, and maybe put us on the map in a serious way as a, as a contender um, in that sport. And you've played in this country, but also France and the UK. What do you think the U.S. can learn from European teams and maybe other international teams and other leagues? Um, it's a great question. I think, you know, the U.S. doesn't like to follow. They like to lead. And in that way, I think we've always kind of said, we're going to do our league um, a little bit different. Like the MLS is a little different. And I think originally, like the NWSL kind of just because of the MLS just kind of um, inherited that type of league structure and rules, and which was very confusing to me because it was kind of apples to oranges in the way, you know, women's football is in the U.S. Um, in kind of the totem pole of of global powers in the way that that men's football is. So it was always very confusing to me that we kind of uh, made our league similar to a league that I think um, ha has is still trying to find its place in the world. Um, but but overall, I think that it's like it's an exciting time for for uh, football in our country. I mean, I like you said, I, I've played overseas. I've seen the strengths and weaknesses. I will say women's sports still in our country. The greatest strength we have is the progress that women have in our country. Um, I, there's just a level of respect uh, here for women's athletes. And and I still think it's early days for us, too. But. Um, I've experienced, you know, an insane amount of sexism in other countries towards women as athletes. And I think that's the greatest barrier. But look, when we're talking about a, a sport like like global football, you've seen just like a glance with these like big clubs looking at their women's sides. They can change the landscape in a second. They have all the infrastructure, all the money to like, it's scary what they could do if they wanted to. And we're seeing that. And we're seeing how it's affected now, you know, the competition and where we where we line up. I mean, the U.S. Women's National Team for the first time um, in our in our program's history is ranked number fifth in the world. And that's that's our worst ranking ever. So I think it just shows um, the level of attention and investment that's going into the sport across the world. Um, and I think it's also showing how um, different cultures and infrastructures can scale quicker and how I think that NWSL and, and soccer in our country really needs to be um, kind of looked at more, more intentionally because I think it was easy back in the days to just be the most invested in federation. But I think like there's a whole pipeline and a whole culture that has to be developed to make sure that the US Women's Ash team and I think the future of you know, our, the sport in our country even professionally can, can remain on the top. All right, Tobin Heath. Thanks so much for joining us on the show. Thank you. That's it for today. If you're enjoying the show, make sure you're subscribed and get your friends to do that too. Thanks for listening. Enjoy your weekend. We'll see you on Monday.